This is mapped out on the hippocampus, more, most particularly by Jeffrey Gray, who is influenced by Sokolov and Vinogradova, who were also students of Luria. Jeffrey Gray used cybernetic theory that was developed by Norbert Wiener, and, which is an AI, uh, which he, he's the father of artificial intelligence, and some of that was actually integrated as well into Piagetian thought because Piaget and Weiner, Norbert Weiner and Luria, if I remember correctly, all went to the same conference back in the early 1920s, mid 1920s, and heard Norbert Weiner speak. So that's how cybernetic theory got built into some of these underlying theories and sort of manifested itself everywhere. So Gray. Gray uses a model very much like this, derived from cybernetic theory, and so here's the idea, how does the brain work? You have a target in mind, then you act to, to manifest the target, you act to transform the world into the target, and then you compare the consequences of your actions to the target, and if they match, then that's a good thing, and if they don't match, then that's what ne where negative emotion comes from. Okay, so how does that work? The hippocampus seems to be central to that, so it detects mismatch. So, so, in the classic behavioral theory, and so this would be Gray's theory, you have your expectations of the world, so that would be your model, and you have your sensory input, which is the real world, and then the hippocampus is mapping one onto the other, one from a top downstream, one from a bottom upstream, and saying, match, 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 and as long as everything matches, then the hippocampus, this is an oversimplification, keeps the subcortical emotional systems inhibited because you don't need them, except for maybe my, mild positive emotion to keep you moving forward. If there's a mismatch, that's anxiety, the anxiety system gets disinhibited, because it's on, it doesn't get activated, it gets disinhibited, that freezes you, and all the other motivational systems are primed, because God only knows what you're going to have to do next. Okay, so then, if you make a mistake, given that scheme, you have to modify the world in order to rectify the mistake, you have to modify your motor output so that you put the world back in order and that's basically Gray's model but Gray's model is insufficient because Gray presumes that what you're comparing your expectation with is the real world but you don't have access to the real world what really happens is that your brain compares the model of the world that you want to have happen, so it's desired and not expected, with the model of the world that you think is happening. They're both models. There's no direct contact with the truth. And so, what that means, and this is what's horrible about this, is that if your model fails, it doesn't only mean that you have to adjust your expectation and change your motor activity, it means you might have to bloody well retool your perceptions. Well, that's a lot more horrifying than just having to change your motor output. If you betray me, then I have to see you differently. And you know, I've, if we've interacted a long time, I've built up a hell of a model of you. You know, it's taken a tremendous amount of effort to generate. And I may have used that model as a predicate for all sorts of other plans, which is what you do with an intimate relationship. And so then, if you do something that indicates a true mismatch, it isn't only that I have to adjust my actions. God only knows what I'm going to have to retool. I may even have to retool my perceptions of myself. I'm a lot more gullible than I thought I was, for example. And God only knows what the implications of that are. If you're close to me and you could do this to me, is that my flaw? And if I'm, am I carrying that into other relationships? It's an absolute catastrophe. And so, Gray actually underestimated the degree of severity of mismatch because he only said, well, it was motor output and, 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 re, and re-world adjusting that would have to be repaired, not perception. Because like most behaviorists, see, the behaviorists had this idea of stimulus, right? The stimulus produces the response. It's like, okay, what stimulus? Well, they never went there. They just assumed that the stimulus spoke for itself, but it doesn't. That's the fundamental weakness of behavioral theory, is that the reason they could get rid of the mind was because they hid it invisibly inside the idea of the stimulus, which was all of a sudden not just something that was a sense, like a piece of sense data, but that had motivation built into it. Well, no. You, no, you can't do that. The, the motivation, you can put the motivation in the object, but then it's no longer an object. It's something completely different. Okay, good. Let's stop there. When you come back, I'm going to tell you a bunch of stories, okay? So we'll break for 15 minutes. <laughs>